Um, so uh, welcome to the uh, chapter four lecture. Um, we did go ahead and skip two chapters, uh, chapter two and chapter three. Um, we've covered those in the past and there's just more valuable material for our time than those chapters. Uh, for example, chapter three was was over cascading style sheets. Well, we've already covered cascading style sheets. Yes, there's a little, uh, a few things here and there that you can learn that are different when you're working in Visual Studio and when you're working with server controls, but nothing to spend an entire three days on. Um, so there's a lot of new uh, information in this chapter. And so um, kind of looking at the objectives here, Believe it or not, we're going to work with a database in this chapter. So for the first time, we're going to show you how to read information out of a database and put it onto your web page. Um, so that's pretty neat. This chapter is called Developing Multi-Page Web Application. And so you're going to have multiple pages. In your HTML, you guys know how to go from page to page. That's with the anchor tag. Okay? Um, but you can't automatically just using HTML redirect someone from one page to another. For example, if you go to an old domain, let's say you had an old domain name but you've rebranded and now you have a new domain name. And so if someone types in the, the URL of the old domain and you want it to automatically redirect to the new domain. Uh, you might know how to do that using JavaScript but you could do that using C Sharp as well. And so um, the second idea here, a uh, second bullet, is now that we have a multi-page application, how do we go from page to page using C Sharp? Um, then bullet number four, using a new concept here, is this concept of session state. Okay, And it's how you keep track of a user on a per session basis. So you could track user information or state information using this. Essentially what it is is a scope. It's a type of scope. Uh, it's called session state. And, and working with your data with session state variables is what they end up becoming. So we'll definitely do that. And then uh, just how to set a starting page for the application. That's pretty simple. We're going to look at some of the different important folders in web forms, app code, app data. We're going to add classes to our web application. So um, we'll introduce a C Sharp class and how do you just add that into your web application. Again, working with the, the transfer methods, working with absolute and relative URLs, work with the SQL data source and how to pull data out of that data source and put it on the web page. Um, so that's what this example is going to wind up being, this coding example uh, out of the book where you have this uh, database. You retrieve information out of the database to populate a drop-down list. It also, depending on what you select, has a different image and has some different text here. Um, and then there's a shopping cart. You'll be building a, an entire shopping cart I believe it's complete in this chapter. So there's actually quite a bit of code. Um, you go from one page to the next. Notice you go from the order page to the cart page and transfer the information um, from one page into the next about you know what are you adding to the cart. And then that's going to populate a list box full of your orders. And um, you know, here's a screenshot of the uh, solution. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. And so to kind of uh, begin to dissect this, we've got an app code folder. And in the app code folder, that's where you're going to put your C Sharp classes. So if you're writing C Sharp, right? It's safe to say that that C sharp belongs inside of app code. Okay, so that's that's the purpose of that folder. App data, if you're working with a database, the app data is where you're going to put your database. So app code app code is C sharp. 
app data is your database. Well, your images folder, if you have any static images not located in the database, it belongs in the images folder. Your styles, that's your CSS. And then there's just two ASPX pages along with a web config. Okay, so yeah, it's a lot of different things, but any individual thing's not too complicated. So we talked about the purpose of app, app code, C sharp data, app data is your database. App themes, we haven't worked with themes yet, but we will in an upcoming chapter. That's where uh, you could put things like a master page inside of a themes folder. And it's just a summary of those things. Uh, let me go ahead and launch Visual Studio here and review just a couple of things. Let me go ahead and close the solution here. Um, we just had a, a hands-on test and so this is a review because some people struggled to even create a new project. Um, so it's good to just kind of review this here. If I hit File New Project and I click on Web I have an ASP.NET web application. Now this is a template, essentially. This template's gonna come with a bunch of additional files, okay? Um, so there's a little bit of difference between saying file new project and clicking a web application. Let me just demo this. If I click OK, now the next thing is it's going to pop up. OK, you want a .NET application. Uh, there's a couple different ways you can build them. Uh, so this is a new interface that we used to not get. But since we're writing web forms, we're just going to click on web forms, um, <laughs> add folders and references for web forms. That's fine. We're not hosting in the cloud. We're not adding unit testing at this point. So just a web forms application. Click OK. And it's going to take a minute here because it's going to add a lot of different, a lot of different stuff. Yes. And you can kind of see down here it's just going through and adding. Well, it was listing all the things it was adding. Maybe if I. Let it go, it'll pop back up. There it goes. And there's a lot to look through here. You could see this dot master for a master page that we'll cover in a chapter or two. Global ASAX. Really, you don't have to mess with it too much. If you just go ahead and launch, default that ASPX. You can see it comes with a lot out of the box. And, and this is kind of a, a place to demonstrate this. If you just create the project in this way, you've got a full login system ready to go. And so it does have a theme, right? But out of the box, we can click register. And it's going to take a little bit for the first time. Now if we click register, of course it doesn't like my password, so let's just make it there we go. So this first time we go through and we create a user through this template, it's going to take, oh, I don't know, 15, 20, 30 seconds to spin because what it's actually doing behind the scenes is creating a database uh, for us to log in with. And if I log back off and click log in,
put in a bad password, it'll no invalid login attempt. But if I put in the correct password, log in, it remembers me. Um, so it has that ability built in. Again, it just has a lot of things kind of built in. And so it's worth your time to kind of peek into a template like this and see how it works. Now, it might be a little complicated because we haven't covered a lot of these concepts before, like master pages, etc. But it does come with a lot out of the box. Now, if I come back in here, let's see if I refresh this. And what I did was I opened I opened the folder in File Explorer. It wasn't showing here. I was trying to get it to refresh. It wasn't showing it inside of my App Data folder. But what I did was I opened App Data inside of Windows Explorer. And this is the database that it created for me. It created this ASP.NET Project 1. Looks like today's date some random 4010.mdf and normally you can see that inside of app data it's not wanting to to show that right now normally it does show it but again if you open it here you can see it and then normally what I would do is I would open this Let's do it this way. File, add, existing item. There we go. Normally I like to just open up the database and take a peek at it real quick. Um, it's giving me a hard time when I try and do that here. Okay, but that's okay. We don't have to look at the database right now. We can do that later when we get into more about the databases. Um, so that's one way of creating an application. Uh, another thing that this chapter is going to show you, and this is real simple. You know, here we've got an about page, a contact page, a default page. Um, if you just, if you don't click on any of those and you launch the program, and obviously in this case we launched it in debugging, it has a default page that it starts up. Of course, because we're in debugging, it takes a while. And the default page is default.aspx. Um, but you could change that, right? If I right click about and set a startup page. So when you have multiple pages in your project, you want to change the default home page. It's pretty simple. Right click, set a start page. Now if I launch the web application, you can see the URL is the about.aspx. So can this replace Brackets. Yeah, so in this case, you're writing your web application in Visual Studio, not brackets. Right. You can write all your HTML, you can write all your CSS, you can write your JavaScript. It can all be written in Visual Studio. So for this class, yeah, you're going to be using Visual Studio. Absolutely. Okay. And so now another way. And I, again, this is from last chapter a little bit. If I close this solution, another way of creating a project, instead of having the template, just say file, new website, an empty website, an empty ASP.NET website. Chapter four, demo two. And this is what I showed you in the last chapter, where there's literally only a web config. And, and that web, after that web config, you can do things like adding a web form. Oops, 
Let's do that again. Add a web form. It wants a master page. So let's do it the long way. Add a new item. Add a web form. Uncheck select a master page. That way it doesn't ask me about a master page when I don't have one. And this is where you would start start your projects. And so you can drag and drop. You can code in the source code. Split view. Right? Same thing here. If I have... Let's see if we can... Oh, that says... I'm going so fast. There's a web form with master. This is just an empty web form without a master. So there we go. We'll just click that one. Default to. And so I just have a default page and a default to page. Either one of them, you can view them in browser. View in browser, view in browser. Same thing here though. If you just right click and set a start page, then if you just launch it, then it will launch that page as your start page. If I change the start page to default to set a start page, now I just launch it. It should open up default to, which you see you see there. So this template um, has looked different over the years. Every time I teach this class, I teach this class once a year, this startup template looks a little different. Um, it's always had that ability to log in. It's always had a master page. Something that's new to this template that used to not be the case is at least last time it had bootstrap. And so if I open up, if I close solution, yes, file, open, this is my chapter four class demo, nope, that was last year. I forgot what the heck I called it, and I've got so many in here. Chapter 4, Demo 2. Let me do an open recent file. I could just start up another one if I need to, but so if you're in projects, how about the taken website? Well, for example, if I say file new project and I say website, oh this is this is the location here. It's under source repos. So let's go to that location. File, open, project solution. <laughs> there it is. Know where you save your files. If not, just do what I did there. Class 4 demo, class 4 solution. Anyways, all of this to say that it should be responsive. And when I go in here, there you go. So it's got a bootstrap template out of the box. And if you start digging into the site master page, you could see some bootstrap classes and if we expand scripts you can see there's bootstrap
So they demonstrate the startup page. Um, again, the app code folder. We're going to start writing some C-sharp code, and that's where we're going to place it. And so if I go back, open a website, Chapter 4, Demo 2. Uh, so if we have an empty web application, uh, we can get an app code folder just by right-click, add an ASP.NET folder. And so this, this right here is where we can find a lot of those directories that we were talking about earlier. App code is the one we need. Uh, and then once we have the app code folder, we can right-click, add, we can add a C-sharp class. From in our PowerPoint, the class is named cartitem.cs. We can add cart item, and here's our constructor. We can write our properties, and this is where we would write our C sharp code. All right. Um, next thing here is uh, to transfer between pages, and so easy enough to say, hey, you guys already know how to do this with a regular old anchor tag. So on page one, we can code a link to page two. And then if we open up page two, we can code a link to default.aspx. And so pretty simple stuff so far. We see the URL changes. We go back to page one. Um, nothing too special there. But if we wanted to, from within C Sharp, change pages, um, there'd be a different way of doing that. For example, on on default, if I open up the code behind, here's our page load, and so maybe. If someone goes to an old web page that you don't want them, that's an old page, you don't want them to go to that page. Um, the easiest way that I've always done this is with the response dot redirect. And this is literally the easiest way that I know how to do it. And so all you have to do is go to page one view it in the browser, when it loads, you see it automatically redirects you to page two. And so that's that's the simple way. Um, the book actually shows you three different methods and I just showed you the redirect. Uh, the other way is redirect permanent. So response dot I'll make sure here. Redirect permanent. There it is. Now here's the difference between the two that I just demonstrated, right? Redirect and redirect permanent. Redirect's pretty simple. Redirect permanent is literally maybe you had an old domain and you needed to permanently redirect them to your new domain. And so what this is supposed to do is also notify the search engines that the, this is a permanent redirect. We're never going back to the old domain. And so the search engines will know to forget about your old domain. So why wouldn't everyone just use this instead? Well, again, it's this is a scenario for like old domain, new domain. Response.redirect, this is just taking you from one page to another to another page, right? Yeah. So they're response.redirect. This is what I what I always used. Okay, because I wasn't really dealing with transferring from old domains to new domains as much as, hey, I just need to go from one page to the next. And I want to do it in C Sharp. And so a lot of times, for example, here's what, you know, uh, I would have, for example, I would have a button. Okay, and on this button, 
I would have a button click. And on this button click, I would do some things. I would say, um, send an email. Okay? And that would be the first thing that I would do. And then I I would um, tell user if email sent or did not send. Like, hey, thank you for sending your email. Or there was an error. Your email did not send. And then I would redirect them to success page or failure page. Um, one application I built for Rankin, um, I can demonstrate this functionality. Actually, here. Uh, just by demonstrating the uh, the contact form, right? This contact form right here is an ASP.NET web form. And when you fill this out, okay, and click send message. This doesn't really demonstrate the... Um, doesn't really well the page did reload I did see that and you get email sent successfully okay now hopefully if I check my email with an HTTPS there's the email okay so that's just demonstrating C sharp web form sending an email another app that does a little bit de better demonstration Is there was a referral system that I made, man, I probably made this seven, eight, nine years ago, long time ago. And what this does is it checks against my Active Directory username and password. So the first thing is, this is my inside ranking username and password. Okay? And obviously, if I enter a bad password, it doesn't accept it. Now, when I had a good login, it redirected me to this page, and I don't know what it's called anymore. And you can see that the the actual page name and the page extensions are hidden, right? That's kind of a security thing. Most websites do that nowadays. Click on Academic Referral. There used to be a few more options here. Otherwise, we could have just skipped this page. If I click Continue, and now you can see it sends us to this page. So by clicking a Continue button, that Continue button had a response redirect in it. And it sent us from one page to another. Now, now that I've logged in, first off, you see that it kept my username in a welcome message? So it welcomed me. So I did that with a session state variable where I took a username out of a text box and then filled it in a label on the next page. Now, once I click continue here, it's going to take that username, query it against a database to, ret to return the classes that I teach, okay, as far as the classes that I'm listed on. So what it does is it puts on all the classes that I'm listed on. Now, because some of my responsibility is to make sure that the other instructors are doing what they're supposed to do, I'm listed on all the classes. Okay. However, if I was only teaching this class, this is you guys right here. Now you notice once I change the drop-down list, what it did. It refreshed the page. I don't know if you saw that. Watch, watch this little icon right here. Change it, and it refreshes. Okay? This is used by the entire school. This application is used by the whole school. So you guys have all been referred at some point for one reason or another, or you've seen your friends who've been referred. Okay, this is the referral system. And this is how we instructors, how we use it. And so I'll just click on this page. I'll click on my class, and then here's all your names. Okay? Now, I can click on any one of you, uh, click on Mitch, and a little bit of his information is over here. This is my faculty ID, student ID, and things like that. I could say that Mitch's grade is an A, and I'm submitting a referral for, he doesn't take notes. Okay? 
and please ignore this referral. This was done for a class demo. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click submit. It's going to send an email and then it's going to redirect me. Okay, so I'll click submit. An email has been successfully sent. You will now be redirected. Well, actually, there it goes. It takes you all the way back to the beginning. Okay, so just showing you how redirects could be used through C Sharp because a lot of times you want to do something first and then, and then redirect the user. And that's what I demonstrated. Just to show you another feature of this referral system, because I'm an admin, because I made the darn system, I made myself an admin, I can go to referral updates, I can click on today, and I can see all of the student referrals that were submitted. And there's Mitch's. Huh? That's the teacher. That's a teacher that sent the referrals. So you could tell that she was using this referral system today. Okay. So just demonstrating a little bit about how you can make a web application uh, that re redirects people. Now this transfer method, Again, I use the redirect or redirect permanent. I have not used the transfer method, and I don't even like it as much as the others. Um, let me demonstrate it here real quick. Because of instead of response.redirect, server.transfer. Okay, so again, the whole thing here is that when page one loads, it's going to redirect us to page two. Now look, and this is why I don't like server.transfer. It actually did direct us to page two, but look at the URL. It still looks like page one. That's why I don't like server.transfer. So it just shows what page two says? It, it takes you to page two, but the, the URL doesn't update itself. So the, that's, it's not accurate to me. I don't like it. It, it works because it, it does redirect you to the page, but it doesn't update the URL. So if you were to copy and paste that URL right now, would it send you back to Yeah, if I were to copy and then paste and go, well, because each time, it, each time it'll send you back. Okay. Because I did it on page load. Okay. Okay. What so if, that's, what if it were to be on like an event? Then it would just show you page one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so where we left off, um, talking about redirection, and uh, for the first time in this chapter, uh, or really in in our curriculum, I think, uh, we're going to start taking information from one page and bringing it onto another page. I don't think we did that with JavaScript, did we? You did? Okay. Okay. So we did we did do it in JavaScript, um, and so as you can imagine, there's probably another way of doing it in .NET. And there's a couple ways. So if I if I kind of talk about what we're doing is we're going to take data from page one and display it on page two. And so if a user fills out their username on page one and then they click a button, you know, and it redirects you to page two, you could have that uh, pull up on page two. And there's really two approaches that, that we're going to talk about, two ways of doing this. The first one is called cross page posting. And another one is with session variables. Okay. And so the first technique that we're going to learn to do that exercise is cross-page posting. And uh, this is page one. You can already see I've got a button on it. 
and cross page posting is done with the button. So cross page posting demo. If I look at the, the button uh, properties, you can see there's a post back URL. So the default behavior of a button is to post back to the same page. Matter of fact, I can view this in the browser. Oops, I still have it redirecting. Let's take that out. <coughs> view this in the browser. And if I can click, you can click the button all day, it's going to post back to the same page. Right? So this is called this is called a post back. You can see it refreshing. Uh, but instead, what we're going to do is we're going to tell its post back URL to go to a different page. And if you look at the source code, it still has a button ID. We'll just call it button click. We can change it here. Or you can change it in the properties window. Notice by changing it in the source code, it also changes it here. Run at server, which is on all of our server controls. On click, we call a C sharp event handler and the post back URL. And we'll say cross page posting. And so let's let's launch this. And you can see now that that button directs you to another page. Okay? However, we have not taken in taken any information and displayed it on this other page. All we've done is got this button to go back to a different page. And so on page two, actually, what I'll do is I'll I'll add a uh, we can have a text box on here for the user to fill out some information. So I'll add a text box. I'm gonna call this text username. So that's the name. That's the idea of our text box. And then in our default two. We're going to write some C-sharp code here. And there's a property called previous page, which means we did a cross page post back, right? And if the previous page is not equal to null, we can instantiate a text box and we'll call this text username and so text box previous page dot find control and this is where you the ID of this control on page one, this text username that goes into right here. Okay, so we instantiate a text box, we'll call it text username, we'll just call it text name to avoid confusion. And we assign it equal to, this is doing a cast, the text box is casting whatever control is found with the text username. So we're getting the, the control to go from one page to another, is essentially what we're doing. But on this page, it's called text name. On this first page, it was called text username, I think. All right, so here's default two. And what we need to do is we need to have a label. We'll call it label. We'll call it label result. Run at the server. And it's blank by default. 
So that's on page two. And then all we need to do to finish out this code is set the label result dot text equal to the text name dot text. Okay, and so that's one way to get the data out of the text box on the first page into a label on the second page. It's all done with this find control method that belongs to this previous page object. All right, so you see if the previous page, if it's not empty, then we can do a find control on it, put it inside of a text box control, assign the text of the label equal to the text of the text box. Let's see if it works. View it in browser. And there, the person's name goes from point A to point B. Okay, that's one way to do cross page posting. The book gives you another way, but for the sake of time, it's another way of doing this, another, the same thing. So I'm going to just stick to my example of doing one here. So we've covered that, we've talked about posting back, changing the post back URL, using the find control method. The other way of doing a cross page post back is working with properties. Let's see here. But because we're short on time, I'm gonna come might come back to that or just skip it for now. Uh, showed you response redirect. Re response that redirect can use absolute URLs. You could use relative URLs. Um, you could go up the directory path a couple times. That's all from your HTML days. You could use the tilde that represents the root of your directory. So if you need a link to something off of the root, this is going to be the image directory off of the root or the cart.aspx back on the root. Okay. Now the next demonstration um, deals with, for the first time, dealing with the database. And so I just thought I would demonstrate that. Let me go to my default page and I'll make a little database section here. And the first thing when working with the database is you need to get the database in your project. And so um, to do that, I'm going to add an ASP.NET folder. I'm going to add app data because that's where your database belongs. And I'm going to add an existing item. Now I just downloaded the student files onto my computer, C drive, Muroc, and there's my database. And just to demonstrate the database, uh, this is a typical error you get because it's an, this database was written in an older version or a different version of SQL, uh, SQL Server. So it's a pretty common error to get here. They go about fixing it. Give it a second here. Okay, eventually this popped up, Server Explorer. 
And what I do to fix it, if I go to Modify Connection, and I literally click OK, then it says the database file you are attempting to connect to is not compatible. You must upgrade the database file. Do you want to upgrade the database file? And I say yes. And then like magic, our database is compliant and playing nice. Okay, so now, again, what it did is I double clicked it here in our solution explorer. It opened up server explorer. It sat here and spun for about a minute and gave me an error. I right clicked at that point and I clicked modify. I clicked modify and uh, clicked OK and then gave me a notification about upgrading the database. I said yes and it updated. Um, just to show you the data inside of here, you know, maybe I just click the states table and I can show table data. And in here I've got all 50 states worth of data. Okay, now how to get this information? Maybe I just want to show all the states, uh, state code. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to display the state code in a drop down list. Um, there's a short way of doing it, a long way of doing it. Let me go back to my toolbox. And uh, This is on page two I'm doing this on. Obviously I need a drop down list. So I'm gonna drag my drop down list here. And it says choose a data source. Well, right now I don't have a data source, okay? Um, but from this wizard, you can add a new data source. But you know, if I'm really gonna start from the ground up, instead of using this wizard to add a data source, I can add my own data source. And that's under the data tab under a SQL data source. Now this control, this SQL data source, it's not visible to an end user. So it's there for you to use when you're designing the page, but an end user will never see this on their page. And we configure the data source. Uh, because we already have the Halloween in our app data, it recognizes that and it gives us an option you know, as far as, you know, what database are we connecting to, it'll create what's called the connection string and save that in our web config file. We're going to save this in our web config file called connection string. And it brings up this wizard. Now, this says what columns from a table should we choose? Well, here are our different tables. If we drop down and you see the states table, and we're just using a little GUI at this point, and all we're really interested in is the state code. You can see here, if you've ever seen SQL before, this is the SQL statement that it's writing for us. Select the state code from the states table. Click on next, you can click on test query. And you can see now we're only selecting that particular column out of the database. Click on finish. Now we've configured our data source and we have to bind our drop down list to use that data source. Now we have a data source called SQL data source one. And really we only have one thing that it retrieves is the state code. Click on OK. And I'm going to it's very common to enable an auto postback. So when you change the value of the drop-down list, it does a postback. But now you can see inside of our drop-down list, we walk through the steps to pull data out of a database. Okay, so that's kind of the intro, how to interact with data out of a database. Um, if I go back to our database here, if I look at the tables, if I look at the customers,
we could do something more complex uh, like display all of the customer names who live in that state you know so if I select Alabama it's going to show me all of the first and last name from Alabama um, see if I can do that real quick even though time is limited So the control I'm going to use is a grid view. And I'm going to need another SQL data source. If I configure the data source to use our connection string. This time we're selecting the customer's first and last name. I'm going to click where the state equals the drop down list one dot selected value and I can test it it's going to ask me for the value of our of what's your state code and now I see those three customers from that state I click on finish then I tie that to my data source go ahead and save it and see if it's that simple no customers from Arizona or Arkansas Arizona has two customers okay So that's uh, the quick version of working with a database and a SQL data source. Kind of look through here. They show you the wizard steps to configure that in the slideshow. They show you a little bit of the actual code that was written for you. Now, I didn't show you that code, right? They just showed you the server control for a SQL data source. Again, more of the wizard, some of the attributes that are uh, part of the uh, controls for binding a drop-down list. So the data text field and the data value field, again, that was all configured in the wizard. But if you look at it here, if I look at the source, the data text field, the text field is what the drop-down list shows. And the value field would be what is the value, you know, for example, if it says Illinois, if, if the drop-down list says Illinois, the value might be IL. So that you can program against the value IL instead of programming against the text Illinois. So literally it's what it displays versus what is the value in C sharp is the difference on these attributes on this drop-down list. And again, this is just more code that was generated for you when you run through that wizard. Uh, the last thing to demonstrate in this PowerPoint is session state. And session state is another way of maintaining information about a user. As a matter of fact, they summarize kind of <coughs> A couple different ways or reasons we would use session state uh, to track information about a user, to save objects that a user is working with, or to keep track of pending operations. Like if you're, you know, you're, you're stepping through a wizard and you have multiple uh, wizard steps, that you could place information from each step into a session state. Um, but each time. Each time in a typical uh, HTML page, remember we said HTML is stateless, meaning it doesn't remember information about a user. Uh, but ASP.NET has this built-in 
way of tracking information about a user called session, uh, session state. And it's pretty simple to work with. Um, I guess I'll just open up my demonstration here. I'll go back to my home page. And the thing that's nice about this is this isn't just from one page to another, but this can be tracked across an entire site. So once you have a session variable stored for a user, it lasts for that user's session, which by default is 30 minutes. So as long as you track the session variable, as long as that user is recognized by the web server is recognized by its session, uh, you you can maintain track of that information. So, um, I guess I'll add a button to demonstrate this. There we go, create session variable. And here's the syntax for a session variable. Pretty simple, just the keyword session. And then in quotes is the name of your variable. So you've got session, a set of brackets, a set of quotes, and then we'll just call this username. Okay, so this is creating a session variable. And then what I'll do is, all I'll do is I'll have this create the session variable. And then I'll change pages to page two <coughs> with the link. And then I'll load the session variable into a label. when we click this button. So this will say nothing. Its ID is label name. Button session. The text will say click to get the session variable. When we click it, we'll set label, res oh, this was label name, dot text equals, and this is how you get the data out of a session variable. You do it with session, forget what we called it, what we call it, username with case sensitivity. Now, probably going to have to convert this to a string. There we go. So all I demonstrated was putting data into a session variable getting data out of a session variable. And I did it pretty quick uh, for the sake of time here. If I view this in the browser, create the session variable. So you click it, it should have been created. I navigate to page two. I get the session variable. And let's see where... Let me put a breakpoint in right here. Start debugging real quick. Change the start page to be the right start page.
see if there's anything in there. Session sub username is blank. Oh, I guess I got to put something in there for it to work. Good night. Oh, my goodness. If I put my name in there, now I create the session variable. Now we play it through, and there. I thought my last demonstration was going to break. We got it to work. Okay. That's the session variable. That's as simple as it gets. Obviously, the book's going to get a little bit more complicated. Okay? But I want to show you the basics, you know, step one before you take step two and three. Okay? That's for the last of that lecture.